as today we read his, his last letter, we're going to see who he's writing to, and, and it's obvious, to Timothy. Timothy was his protege, sort of the guy he was raising up. I assume probably by this time, Timothy was already ordained. He was young. He was a young man. It is believed that Timothy had a stomach problems. Paul tells him to drink a little wine for, 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 uh, for his stomach. He might have been a man that belly ached a lot. Also, the Bible says in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, that, that Timothy was a man that wept as well. So he could have, he could have been emotional as well. He could have been a timid, timid man. So he had all these things, and we're going to see what Paul tells him. And it's important because Timothy now did not have Paul by his side. Paul, after he, uh, he was released from his two-year house arrest, eventually he went back to Rome, and then he, he was in a dungeon instead of, a, of house arrest. Now it was getting worse, worse persecution for Paul. It's assumed that he had weeks before he was beheaded. Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, his last letter to Timothy. Now, I remember being incarcerated before, not in a jail, of course, maybe juvenile. But I would, have been, I would write to my wife. I wouldn't be writing to, to another man. But, but Paul thought it was worthy and important to write to Timothy to encourage him because he did need that encouragement. And in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, it's only seven verses that we're going to cover, but there is a lot there. And it's three points. Three points that we're going to cover. Our first point is to be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Our second point is to strengthen others with that strength. And our third point is to remain faithful. These are the basic things that, that Paul told Tim, Timothy so he can press on. So he can press on the good fight. Because during this time, Paul could have been depressed. He could have been um, down. He is literally in the dumps, in a dungeon, possibly rats and cold there. In another part of the Bible, it says that he asked for, he asked one of, uh, for somebody to bring him his, his jacket because he was cold. He was suffering. But Paul didn't let that stop him. He pressed on without fear, and he wrote this letter to Timothy. And now we can be blessed from it. And we're going to see here what he writes to Timothy. Now we're going to read over the verses first, and then, and then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, bow our heads for prayer. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 1. Paul's talking to Timothy here, he says, You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. <laughs> and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. Verse 3, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone com competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer must be first to partake of the crops. And then verse 7, consider what I say, and may, thy Lord, may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Gracious Father, we come to you in prayer today, Lord. We come to you asking, Lord, that you just uh, empty us, Lord, of ourselves. That you allow us, Lord, to, to come with you with an open mind, Lord, with a clear conscience, Lord, to receive from you, Father God. Give us a heart to, to receive from you today, Lord. Help us, Lord, to, to understand. Give us understanding of your word. Help me, Father, to teach it simply, Father God. Let your Holy Spirit, Father God, just flow through this place and, and speak to the people. Speak to me, Lord. Speak to us corporately, Lord. We want to pray, Father God, for those people at, at the Boston uh, Marathon, Lord, that, that were killed, Father God, their families, and, and those that are, that are injured and in terrible condition, Father God. All those people there, Father God. We just pray, Father God, for their lives. We pray for their hearts, for their salvation, Lord. We pray, Lord, that, that, that you bring justice there, Father God. That you find the people that did that. And that you just bring justice. Because you alone, Father God, are judge. We pray, Lord, that you comfort those, Father God. Those parents that are hurting, Lord. Those children that are hurting, Father God. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Now back to Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. So here we see Paul writing to Timothy. He says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Notice that relationship Paul had with him, with his protege Timothy. They, they, they had an ongoing relationship. Paul had been discipling Timothy. He calls him his son. I don't know if you guys have had that sort of relationship with, with another, uh, that sort of brotherly phileo love relationship with another Christian brother or sister for that matter. Right? A, a more mature sister that is raising you up to, to, uh, to get closer to God, that points you to Jesus, that encourages you, and sometimes exhorts you when you need to be exhorted. This, was, this is what Paul was to Timothy. And they had this, this relationship, sort of a spiritual father uh, to Timothy. That's what Paul was. And he says, you therefore, my son. And he tells him again, this is, what, this is why it is believed that, that, that Timothy was timid. Timid Timothy. He says, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul tells him something, right? Be strong. And this is not the only time he says it. Throughout the scriptures, when he's referring to Timothy, he encourages him, tell him, be strong, be strong. If, 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 it, is, if it is something, if the Bible repeats something, it's for a good reason, okay? It's for a good reason. There's more emphasis there. Possibly Timothy was being looked down upon because of his youth. They were despising his youth. I know Paul, he had, a, he had, he had been deserted. He had been deserted. There was, oh, oh, if I'm pronouncing it right, Onisporus. Onisporus, he, he was still with Paul. But the rest, they had deserted Paul. So throughout the scriptures, Paul's going to tell him throughout this passage that, you know, to endure. Because this is going to happen to you too. People are going to leave. You will be deserted. And that's why he tells him, be strong, but not in himself. Not in himself. He says, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And that's our first point, to be strong, right? Not in ourselves, but to be strong in the Lord. And how do we do that? It's through grace. It tells us, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. This brings us to our first uh, sub point. Acknowledge grace. We have to acknowledge what grace is. Now, I don't think we can fully comprehend what, what grace is. We do know from a, a Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, we are saved by grace through faith. Not, this is not of ourselves. It is a gift from God. We know that it's, some, it's a divine favor from God that we cannot attain. We cannot merit this, but God gives it to us freely. It's, it's, it's great. It's, it's a free gift from the Lord. Webster's uh, Ninth College Dictionary defines grace as unmerited divine assistance given man for his regeneration and sanctification. I agree with that. Grace, grace is needed for all things. It's, it's needed for our salvation. It's needed for our sanctification, our growth. Grace is needed for everything, but there's something called common grace. Common grace is, 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 is a grace that is given to all. It's not just for Christian. Common grace is, is a grace that, that, that we see when the sun rises in the morning and when the sun sets, when the moon goes up as well. The Bible says that the sun rises on the, on the wicked and also on the righteous. Common grace is for everybody, right? Because we have air to breathe, regardless of what you, if you believe in God or not, that's common grace. We, can, we, we see that grace. It's upon all mankind regardless of salvation. Matthew 5.45 says, he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. That's common grace. Psalm 145, 8 through 9 says, The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. The Lord is good to all. That's grace. That's, that's that common grace. So we must understand, though, that whether it's common grace or sovereign grace or the grace that strengthens Christians, it's still a free gift. It's still a free gift. So we have to understand this. I, t I sort of want to call this grace, the grace that helps us grow in our salvation, providen providential grace. Providential grace because we get it by asking for it. We get it by growing in the Lord. And this grace, I believe, it can only be attained by Christians. It can only be attained by Christians. So it's a practical grace. Practical favor for Christians. 
2 Corinthians 9 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all suffici sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. So there are certain amounts of grace that someone can have. There are certain amounts of grace that we can have. Certain amounts of favor we can have from the Lord. And we need that. That's why if we go back to ver verse uh, 1, Paul tells him to be strong in the grace that is in found Jesus Christ. This practical grace, this providential grace that comes from asking God. Psalm 84.11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those, see it's exceptional, from those who walk uprightly. So this verse basically tells us you have to walk uprightly. If you're walking uprightly, if you're following God, if you're not following sin, practicing sin, you will get this grace from the Lord. In Ephesians 6, verse 10 and 13, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. This is Paul again saying to, talking to the Ephesians. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. All the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, right? the belt of truth, the feet, the feet shed with the gospel, right? All this, this is grace. This spiritual stuff that we put on that we got to ask. I sort of touched on it last week as well. That is grace, and Paul is telling him, for the ministry, you're going to need this. Yeah, this is, these, these are the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy, Philemon. But it's not, it's not just for pastors or people that are, that are going to be pastors. It's for, for the whole church, because we all need grace. We all need grace. A lot of people that, are, that, 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 that come from legalistic churches, you know, they, they focus on the law. They want that law, right? They're taught that it's by the law. You know, you, you have to do this and that. And yeah, yeah, we accept grace, but we're, but, but we're, but we're going to help God. We're going to try to keep, we're going to keep the Ten Commandments. You know, we're going to worship on, on the side. We're going to keep the Sabbath, right? We can't keep the Sabbath. We cannot keep the Sabbath. Take a look at the Jehovah's Witnesses. Why do you think they go door to door? They go to door to door because they're trying to put it in hours so they, one day they can be approved by God and get resurrected again. They're trying to get points. They're trying to go door to door as a works, salvation. That's not grace. They're trying to do it by the law, right? What does the Book of Mormon say, right? For, yes, we're saved by grace through faith and by everything you can do. That's heresy. It's by, we need that grace, and this is what Paul is telling them. It's by grace. This is the grace that we need. But another, another sub-point. First sub-point, in order to get strength from the Lord, we need to acknowledge grace, where it comes from, right? Second sub-point, we need to get weak. We need to get weak. That's not a contradiction. We need to get weak in ourselves. Okay, We need to empty ourselves. If we know the doctrine of kenosis, when Jesus emptied himself, not of his deity, because he's fully God, fully man. That's the hypostatic union. Jesus is 100% man, 100% God. He never, he never left his deity. But he emptied himself from certain powers in order so he can humble himself and be a man and come and die for our place. Right? We need to empty ourselves. So we need to get weak in ourselves for God to use us. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 through 10 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is is made perfect in what? Weakness. Weakness. God's strength is made perfect in weakness. Now I'm going to read the same verse in a little bit more context, starting in verse 7 in the New Living Translation. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10 now. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud. Pride, by the way, is being strong in yourself. I was given a thorn in my flesh, a, mes a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. 
That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Something that I struggle with is uh, naturally, naturally, uh, from my background, is it was I struggle with pride a lot. I struggle with pride a lot because I used to think, well, I'm a Christian, but but I still believe in respect. Okay, you still have to respect. You have to respect me because I was somebody in the streets. Okay, you you need to respect me for that. But people don't know that. Why should they care? That's a low life type of a, a life, right? So that respect that you had over here in the world, it's nothing when you come into the, into the into the Christian world. You need to humble yourself. It's the opposite. It's the upside down living, like like Greg Laurie says. You know, we are nobody. We need to empty ourselves and give it to Christ. We need to get get weak. We need to get weak so we can be strong. John the Baptist understood this. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. John the Baptist said that. So, we must acknowledge that we are weak, sort of uh, pouring uh, ourselves out so he can pour into us this power that we need. What kind of things do we need to pour out? Pride is one of them. I've sort of touched on it right now. Pride, stubbornness, doubt. Do we have doubt? Are we, are we Christians that live in doubt? Is, that, is doubt what's causing us to not step out and, 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 uh, <clears throat> and faith to the Lord? Do we have a sort of faithlessness? Is there faithlessness in your life? What about contentment? What if you've been walking with the Lord for, so, for years now and you're just content where you're at? You know? So you're sort of on a cruise control Christian life. You know? I'm, I'm good where I am. You know? The Lord's used me and I'm just waiting for heaven. Right? That can be a stumbling block. And self-reliance, aptitude, meaning I can do all things through myself. Right? We can do all things to Christ who strengthens us. Revelation, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 8 says, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. This was, this was in Revelation, uh, the church of Philadelphia. Jesus did not have any, anything against the church of Philadelphia. On the contrary, they were weak. They might have been weak in numbers, and we can uh, monetarily, they might have been poor. But that beside the point, they, they had that open door where they were at. It was a place with where, where where the port where, where a lot of people passed by, and they had that open door to, to, to tell people about Jesus, right? It was a great opportunity. And these that were weak, the Church of Philadelphia was weak, they were able to, to tell others about Jesus. They were stronger, but they were not... Uh, they were not spiritually weak. They were strong in, in the grace of God. Again, my strength is made perfect in weakness. That's something we have to, to acknowledge if we're going to, to get this grace from God so we can do His work. So acknowledge grace, get weak, and third sub-point, work out that grace. We have to work out the grace that God gives us. Second Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory of both now and forever. Amen. Peter knew this as well. You have to grow in the grace that comes from Jesus. These guys uh, live by that, by the grace of God. This is sanctification, right? If you don't already know what justification is, I'll tell you. Justification means that it's, it's, it's a one, the point when you accept Jesus as, Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The point when you receive him in your heart, he regenerates you right there. Right then and there, it's, it's, it's a certain point. You can time it, right? If it's genuine, of course, that's justification. You are just, just as if you never sinned. You're made right before God. Justification. That's when you get saved. Sanctification, which is what I'm talking about here, working out the grace that God has given you, is a lifelong process. If you're saved right now, the process that you're going through now, you're going through sanctification. And I pray that we're all working out our grace. We're all working out our salvation. Philippians 2.12 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That just means to grow. Grow in Christ. Grow in this grace that God has given us. But what are the evidences? What's the evidence that I'm a growing Christian? I was talking to somebody the other day, 
and I asked him, what is a mature Christian? And he answered me, and he said, um, somebody that knows the word, because this person was boasting about being a mature Christian. He said, somebody that knows the word. To me, that, that's a fat Christian. If that's all you do, if you just know the word, that you're just a fat Christian. You have to do the word. You have to do the word. You have to not just hear it, but do it. Not just drink milk, but eat the meat, right? We have to be in the word, and that's part of, of this grace. This is how we get grace as well. Not just ask for it, but read the Bible. Get plugged in. Go into Bible studies, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, you know, two-on-two, -two, or, or in a church service, you know, when you have one person spreading the word to other people. You might not get that much, sort of, because it's not back and forth, it's just in one direction. But Bible studies, believe me, Bible studies is where you, you can conversate back and forth, ask questions, and get involved. So Bible studies are very important to growing in God's grace, to working our salvation. So we have to chew the cud. That means get in the word. You know, the cow, the cow how, how it eats the grass, right? It chews the cud, it spits it out, back in its mouth, right? You, we have to digest that word. We have to read it over and over again and get the meaning. Get, get the meaning that God has for us. No doubt we have to pray, though, for the Holy Spirit to, to uh, let us know what, we, what God wants to let us know. Peter says about this, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, Like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word. Like newborn babes. So that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. It's interesting what Peter says because like newborn babes, right? A baby, this is, this is God just at work. You know, babies, they don't have to be taught to sort of get latched onto the mother's breast, right? Um, they don't. They are, it's already in their DNA. It's already there. God has put it in, in this magnificent creation, right? So if as a Christian, as a new Christian, you should already have that instinct as well to sort of a hunger to, to get the Word, to get fed the Word of God, and you need it to grow so you can start doing the Word, eating the, eating the meat. Again, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the Word so that by it you may grow in respect to, to salvation. But not only, only the Word, the Bible says, do not forsake the gathering of the brethren. Hebrews, do not forsake the gathering of the brethren. That means fellowship. Fellowship. Get together with other believers. Why? Because, well, you need to. We're, we're not Rambo. We're not, we don't just go solo and uh, go out and don't come back to base, report every now and then. That's not how, how we should be as Christians, you know. I'm only here on, 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 on Easter and uh, Christmas, for Easter and Christmas services, right? That's not, that's not how it should be. We need to grow in God's Word and, and have a, a regular fellowship, regular fellowship, this koinonia fellowship that the Bible speaks about. Another thing that, that I heard in a conference when we went to Marietta a while back with a, with a, with a brother and a sister in Christ of ours was uh, we were listening to, um, what's his name, uh, Mike McIntosh's son, Phil McIntosh. He was teaching on, uh, on sort of, um, you know, if you have too much on your plate, too much ministry on your plate, sort of make your plate bigger or take some stuff out. So he was saying, you men that don't like to go out a lot, you know, get a, instead of getting a vacation, get a staycation. Stay home, you know, kick the wife out or the kids, if you have wife and kids, for a couple of days. and Stay home so you can meditate on God's Word and see, you know, put everything out. See, what do you want me to do, Lord, so I can serve you better? So, so sometimes we have to do that in order to grow in God's grace. We have to sort of get a staycation, stay home, and, and find out. Get some time alone with God and, and find out, you know. Be in prayer. Be in prayer. Another way we grow in God's grace is by getting the fruits of the Spirit, right? we got to get filled with the Holy Spirit. See, there's a difference between uh, the fruits of the Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit come naturally, so love, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, perseverance, long-suffering. But then the gifts of the Spirit are different. This is the, the Holy Spirit gives them as He pleases, the Bible says. So these are different. The, naturally, as Christians, we should have the fruits, Right? That's, that's the strength we get. That's how we work our, our, our grace, by, by practicing these fruits, loving on others. Right? Love is, is the biggest fruit of them all. That's how we work our grace, by loving others. Now we go to our second point. First point, second point. Strengthen others. 
So first, Paul told him, strengthen yourself, strengthen yourself in God's grace. Now he's telling him, strengthen others. Why? Because Timothy had the ministry of a pastor. He was going to strengthen others. He was going to preach the word to others. Look what he says in verse 2. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others. So Paul tells him, the things that you have heard from me. Right? So Paul, throughout their relationship, when he wasn't an incarcerator, of course, he had committed many things to, to Timothy. Not just on one-on-one -on -one level, but other people were, were aware. It says, among many witnesses. Some scholars uh, say that this could have probably been a sort of his ordination ceremony, Timothy's ordination ceremony, where Paul sort of gives them the doctrines, the, thing, the main points to, to just persevere. But this is also what, what Peter said, uh, what it says in Acts chapter 2, you know, that, that the, the, the early believers, right, they were together, they were, they were in the breaking of bread, right, in the doctrine of the apostles. And that, that's what I believe it means as well. It says, in the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Who will be able to teach others also. So the job of Timothy was now, now that he was prepared, or supposed to be prepared, he was supposed to commit the stuff that he heard from Paul, the doctrinal stuff, to faithful men who will be able to teach others. First Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on inter eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Paul could have very well said this in 1 Timothy 6.12 to uh, Timothy during his ordination uh, sermon. This brings us to our first uh, sub-point of strengthening others. We need to acknowledge that it's not our ministry. It's never our ministry. If you're a ministry right now, it's not your ministry. In a ministry that, that you have to teach other people, whether it's kids, the youth, or even just your home with your family. It's not your ministry. Not your ministry. So Paul gave him the ministry so that he might share it with others. That we know. Ephesians 4, 11, 12 says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So the reason we acknowledge that it's not our ministry is because the Bible tells us. It's not for us, and for each individually. It's not my ministry. It's Jesus' ministry. And it has to be spread out. For why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we're pressed together like stones, like Peter says. We're pressed together to build, to build a, a, this temple, the church, the invisible body of Christ. And we need that. 2 Timothy 3 14 to 17 says, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you, whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is why we need it, so we can be equipped for every good work. The Word of God, because it's God-breathed, it's God-inspired. Second sub-point, sub second thing uh, Paul told Timothy, find faithful people, okay? He wasn't just going to, okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find somebody, and then there I'm going to continue to just preach. The, the Bible says something, uh, the Bible says, you know, do not throw your pearls before swine. If somebody continues to just slander the Word of God, or they just demean it, or they just care, could care less for it. After you've tried, after you've been obedient to that calling, Tim, you're not called to commit these. Because why? Because they're not faithful men. When you do find these faithful men, they should be able to teach others as well. They should be able to teach others as well. So the qualification is faithfulness. Sometimes today in the church... We look qualifications. We go. We look for good speakers. We look for strong men, good-looking men, right? No doubt, Apollos was a good-looking man and a good speaker, or or Aaron, right? Moses. What did Moses tell God? You know, well, I'm not good. I'm not a good speaker. Uh, send uh, Aaron, 
right? That's what we look for in the world, for qualifications. But God does not look for that. He looks for faithful people. He says, commit these to faithful people. So it's not about good-looking men, popular men, outgoing, talkative men, charismatic men. That's, that's good stuff, right? But that's usually what we look for. The qualification is faithful men and women. Faithful in contrast to Paul's desertion. They had left them. They weren't faithful. So the one that was faithful, Timothy, he's telling them, now you find faithful people. Find those brothers and sisters that, that you can trust. Make them pillars so they can be used. How? That they can teach others as well. That they can teach others as well. How do we define faithfulness in the body of Christ? Are they going to church? That should be the first thing, right? Are you continually going to church? Are you being faithful in that? Are you being faithful in your home? Are you being faithful in spending time alone with the Lord? Are you being faithful in your prayer life, your quiet time with God? So he wasn't looking for perfect people. Nobody's perfect. But he was looking for faithful people, people that were faithful to the Lord. And we should do that. If you have a ministry today, teach them what you know. Raise them up. Raise them up. The next sub-point, the third sub-point, pour into them. Pour into them. That's basically sort of what, what I've been saying. You, know? you have to pour into the people that are faithful. You teach them. You spend time with them. It takes time. It's hard. You've got to pour into them, though. When I first started coming here to Calvary Chapel, uh, for the first year, I was probably stagnant. I wasn't doing nothing. Uh, I was just coming to church, you know, getting fed, going home, you know. Um, but there was this man named Armando. Some of you already know him. He approached me, and he started talking to me. And, you know, he invited me to Bible study, and then we started going to Bible study. At first, he tried to get me plugged in with Pat, Pat's Bible study, and uh, it wasn't too, I didn't really uh, click there. But then he started Bible study at his house. Jack Valentine was teaching there, Thessalonians. And, and, you know, I was blessed. I was growing in the Lord. I was growing in the Lord, and I was going to continue to go there for about four years. During those four years, I was able to teach the Bible there, went through books, and I started growing. But if he hadn't poured into me, if I, he hadn't done that first step of faith, and pouring into me, committing the word of God, I probably, you know, it would have been a lot harder for me to, to really grow in the Lord. You know, that's why we have to pour into others. Pour into others. Not be prideful, but pour into other people. Well, God has learned us. So it's not our ministry. We need to pour into other people. So pastors and leaders are supposed to disciple others. Sort of give us the essentials and, and the non-essentials. Especially if you're going to be a pastor, you need to know what the essentials are, Right? The virgin birth of Jesus Christ, salvation by grace through faith on the work of cross, uh, on the work of Jesus on the cross, right? And Him alone. Then there's the non-essentials. Okay, well you have to wear a tie to, to church, or you can wear a Hawaiian shirt. But those are non-essentials, right? Those are non-essentials. Non-essential stuff. You gotta hold on to the essentials. Jesus, by the way, didn't just disciple the twelve. He actually poured into. He poured more into the three that he took onto the mountain. He had the three. He had the 12, and then, and then the Bible says that there were 70 as well that he sent out. And then the 500 after his resurrection that saw him. Jesus knew about discipling others, pouring into others' lives. And to finish off here, verses 3 to 7. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics... He is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must first partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. So now, now Paul is telling him, remain faithful. That's our third point. Remain faithful. Endure. Suffer well. Remain faithful. And he gives him three examples, okay? Three easy subpoints. First subpoint: endure like a soldier. Remain faithful like a soldier, okay? A soldier is sold out for his, uh, for his commander, for his chief, he sold out. A good soldier, not just any soldier. Notice what he said in verse 3. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier. There's such a thing as bad soldiers, right? Soldiers that, that maybe are stationed here, that maybe they go across the border and are supposed to get drunk over there. That's, a bad, that's an example of a bad soldier. You know, breaking curfew. A good soldier is one that is obedient. Not just any soldier, but this tells us that we are soldiers for Jesus Christ. We need to acknowledge that if we don't know that. 
No one engaged in warfare, this is verse 4, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of his life, that he may please him. So two things, two things. We must endure hardship. That's opposition from within the church and from without. Sometimes you're going to find opposition within, you know, trying to, you know, expand the ministry. And then from without the churches, well, there's always, there's always going to be persecution. Again, he says a point, engaged in warfare. We need to acknowledge that we're in warfare, right? The enemy doesn't want you to press on. And something more important, he doesn't entangle himself with the affairs of this life. And this is the stuff that, that sort of, uh, if, if you're eager to, if you don't go to church because you want to watch, uh, I don't know, uh, the Bad Girls Club or a Mobster's Wives, or, I don't know, a cooking show. I don't, I don't, I don't watch uh, TV that much anymore. That much. But we shouldn't let this stuff, to entang we shouldn't get entangled in it because it's going to get in the way of our service to God. It says to please Him, okay, with the affairs of this life, you know. Gambling, drinking, all this stuff. This, this, this shouldn't be part of our Christian walk. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great of a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance, there's endurance again, the race that is set before us. You, Christian, today, there is a, there is a race set before you. Where are you? You know, Are you like that, like that, like the... The story of the, the frog and uh, the, t um, what is it? The tur tortoise and the hare. There you go. You know, are you like the hare, you know? You're, you're starting off fast, but you just, you fall asleep because you're confident in yourself. You have that strength in yourself. But even though, see, God is not calling us to, to, uh, to start right, you know, to continue um, fast. He's calling us to finish well. And the, the tortoise might start off slow, but he continues the, he continues the race. We got to endure. We have to endure in the race. because, And we need to lay aside everything that entangles us. Anything that we might get in the way of us serving the Lord. That we may please Him. That's the purpose of life. To please God. It's been said that, that you know, pastors, assistant pastors, and others in ministry, you know, that they're in part-time ministry and full-time ministry. But in, in a sense, we're all in full-time ministry. Whether you're at work or, or you're home or out in the street, you're still in your ministry. That you, that's your ministry. You've always been in ministry. You've always been in ministry. We need to serve the Lord wherever we're at. Spurgeon says, Paul does not exhort Timothy to become a common, ordinary soldier, but to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. For all soldiers and all true soldiers may not be good soldiers. There are men who are but just soldiers and nothing more. They only need sufficient temptation, and they readily become cowardly, idle, useless, and worthless. But he is the good soldier who is bravest of the brave courageous at all times, who is zealous, does his duty with heart and earnestness. And our second sub-point. We have to endure like an athlete. An athlete. Possibly Paul was referring to the Olympic wrestlers back in the day. What does it say about them? We have to endure like an athlete. He says in verse 5, And also if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. According to the rules. So as a Christian, there's rules we have to follow. We have to follow. It. Sort of if you're thinking, well, I need to marry this guy or I need to marry this girl that doesn't know Jesus, but they're going to accept him after I marry them, right? If you're thinking that, you're breaking the rules. No, they're probably not going to accept him. And no, you're, gonna, you're probably going to live a horrible life. You might, you know, you're not going to be able to divorce him unless he leaves you if you're going to do it biblically, right? There's rules we have to follow in order to, like an athlete, to we must be disciplined, like an athlete. Keep focus on the prize. Keep focus on the prize. Heavenly minded. First Corinthians nine twenty seven says, "But I disciple my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified." We got to keep our body under subjection. And third, like a farmer, how do we? How does a, how do we endure like a farmer? First, it was a soldier and an athlete. I understand that, but a farmer. How do how do we endure? Like a farmer. Let's go to verse 6. The hardworking farmer must first must be first to partake of the crops. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. How do we apply that to our lives? Ministry takes hard work. Okay? Ministry takes hard work. We need to work at it. Okay? But you know what? When the farmer 
is done growing the fields, when, when the crops are growing, he is the first one to partake of it. He gets that blessing. Today when I got home, my wife was working on, on our yard, you know, and our yard is sort of, uh, the theme of our yard is a desert, uh, the desert landscape. You know, you got some yellow patches over there, you got some dirt mounds over there. You know, we have a bad, uh, we don't have a good uh, looking yard. But my wife, when I got home, she was working at it. She was planting plants. She, she, she was uh, sowing uh, plants there, right? And she stepped back but when she was done and she looked at it and she, was, she, she, she felt that, that sense of completeness, that sense of, oh, I did it. And that's what we get from ministry when we pour into others, okay? You know, that sense that I've done something for God. Just like the farmer, he works hard, but he can step back and see, wow, you know, people are growing. This is, I'm doing the right thing. People are growing through the Word of God. So I'll finish with this quote from C.T. Studd. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And that's the whole point. Only what's done for Jesus, it's what's going to last. So the three points again. Be strong in the Lord, strengthen others, and remain faithful. If, if you can remember anything, remember those three points in order to press on and, and not fear. Let's, let's close uh, in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, for, for this time of uh, textual worship to you, Father God, of worshiping you by reading your word and, and, and being attentive to it, Father God. I pray, Lord, that, uh, that you have spoken to our hearts today, that we can retain whatever it is you want us to retain, that we can go out, Lord, and, and be strengthened, that we can go out, Lord, and strengthen others, whoever that might be. It might just be one person. It might be that coworker, Lord, that we've been afraid to talk to because of how uh, anti-Christian they are. It might be a relative, a brother, a sister, maybe a mother, Lord. Help us, Lord, to step out and share the good news with them, Father God. Work in their hearts. We pray, Lord, that as we worship you now, Father God, in spirit and truth, that you just continue to, to just pour out on us your Holy Spirit and speak to our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.